Well, I guess a, a round of introductions is probably in order. Um, it's just furious nodding. What is um, that? Wait, what? There's a thing behind you. Yes. <laughs> he doesn't know yet. Did he's in Australia, there, yeah, there's he's a, he's in Australia so it's a spider. Yes. I was going <laughs> to. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I knew spiders in Australia were big, but I didn't realize they were that big. Oh, yeah. Now you're in focus. Hold that. Yeah. Hold yeah. that point. <laughs> Just stay there. You're fine. Listen, if, that, if that's a spider, you're, taking, you're not taking that down with spray. That's a, that's a 12 gauge. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which you, of course, keep handy in the office. How do you think he hurt his hand? Good Christ. Oh, yeah. Oh, we'll yeah. Probably we'll, get to that story. Mm, yes. We lost one. Uh, that's uh, John Paul. Uh, he's typing. So, uh, well, I can introduce John Paul for you then. That's our guitar player. Oh, there he is. Um, Hi, sorry. <laughs> I, I, I'm so sorry that I can't really stay much. I just wanted to pop in and say thank you to everyone involved here. How amazingly awesome you've been throughout this whole thing. And I'm just insanely busy today and work obligations that can't be uh, rearranged for today. But I'm going to be here listening and recording everything. So thank you so much and uh, enjoy the chat, all right? <laughs> Can I say something to you real quick? Of course. I, I, I don't mean to be judgmental, but you're a very good guitar player. <laughs> well, that's, yeah. a, that's an it's honor, over. seriously. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. It's, it's, it's a blast getting to play all those uh, crazy licks and runs you came up with, so. Oh yeah, I didn't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> all right well it's 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 been a blast so far and I, I hope you guys enjoy the the final product so thank you so much oh yeah yeah thanks enjoy okay. thanks cool. uh yeah oh so uh john paul is going to keep a backup recording uh just in case everything else craps out um but yeah he runs a music store somewhere in chicago and apparently they get customers who knew uh so he has to like stand behind the till or something i don't know what he does um but yeah so other introductions <laughs> um so uh, uh jackie is our uh, vocalist who's gonna Hello. be performing on the tracks that actually have vocals um anything you'd like to add to that <laughs> uh i mean you, you may notice that there's a lot of stuff behind me i am absolutely on the clock at work right now i am coming to you live from a projection booth so in the event that i do cut away that's what's going on but i highly doubt they're going to need me for anything um but yeah i'm just i'm you know i've been a fan my whole life so being a part of this is you know monumental to me and <laughs> I, I i'm just happy to be here you know <laughs> uh -huh. well thanks Cheers. I mean, the, the funny story is um uh, jackie and i did some other stuff uh, a, a while back and uh you know just on a whim we were looking for oh who, who could who could like sing the game and stuff like that and so we just you know, asked jackie hey do you want to sing this track off the seventh guest you've probably never heard of it but it goes yeah it goes, you found yeah. the one person that knew all the lyrics already <laughs> <laughs> you, you found the one kid that was playing disc two in their cd player in 1997 constantly <laughs> <laughs> Um, Fred is our resident synth guy now. He wasn't when we started, but he is now. Um, yeah, I basically poke and prod Trolls' arrangements to try to find holes and where can I fit something in that wasn't there before. So essentially, sorry, George, I'm the one who's being really sacrilegious to your original work. <laughs> Thank you. But I you. was asked to do it. <laughs> I appreciate worry, that. I've, I've been there as well. Uh, and Michael is our resident uh, deer hunter slash amateur hand surgeon and also part-time bass player. Did I get a hold of that right? Uh, uh, um, the hand surgeon thing I don't know about, but um, <laughs> uh, all I can say, I was, I was lucky I was dating a vet at the time. Um, she, hmm. she stitched me up good. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. probably a story there we should tell at some point. Yeah, I've got a yeah. question for you. Is it your fretting hand or your fingering hand or picking hand, depending on how you play? It's right down there. So, yeah, it's uh, it's on the fretboard and oh, oh, it sucks yeah. sometimes. I, uh, <laughs> I had a run-in with my index finger and a broken mirror a, a couple of years ago, and I had mm. to play guitar for a big musical thing we were doing at school at that point. It was a bit of a mess. Yeah. Ouch. It's uh, 
Yeah, but the, the, the nerves are getting better. That's it's, you know, I, I can squeeze in about an hour a day and it doesn't hurt as bad as what it used to be. So, you know, you gotta so, suffer for the art sometimes. Yeah, yeah so that's right. If you're wondering why there's no live bass on any of the tracks yet, it's because Michael cut his hand up pretty badly <laughs> just oh, as we were going to start recording. No, it's you don't you don't drive twenty two hours straight from Queensland back to Victoria and then start butchering up a deer with a very sharp knife and pulling you <laughs> half asleep. Just just stupid. <laughs> it's a very it could have been, have been a, a cheese it? grater, right, right, Graham? <laughs> cheese grater. Oh, the thing in the eleventh hour. <laughs> no, doesn't ring a bell. You know, okay. Yeah, that's what I was referring to. I think <laughs> I think Jackie got it. Yeah. I did. <laughs> um, and so obviously the, the, the two remaining people need no introduction, but we should probably give them one anyway. George, the fat man singer, actually wrote the music that we're butchering. Um, how are you doing, sir? Fine, thank you. And you? I've, I'm very honored and very flattered and uh, uh, a little at a loss for words, so I'll compensate by rambling too much. Um, and Mr. Graham Devine who uh, made the seventh guest. <laughs> Hello, sir. How are I you? I was on the team, yes. I was, yes. Uh, uh, yeah. so, uh, but, I mean, we can trace it back to at least two people, and you were one of them, if we're going to get really hard-ass with it. <laughs> and getting the elephant out of the room, the great thing is that the game holds up pretty well. I've, I, I should mention I never really played it back in the day. I'm a bit too young to, you know, have been on the bandwagon <laughs> originally. But I'm play yeah, I, I mean, no insult, of course, but I am. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I've been playing the remaster on the Switch, and, and it actually surprises me how well this game holds up. I wasn't expecting that. So... I think you did great work back in, in the day. Uh, we're not going to mention how long back in the day that was, but... Well, we get a lot of people say, uh, you know, hey, my dad played that game. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, I'm sure George and I get that a lot. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I played that game sitting on my dad's lap. Well, I was almost sitting on my dad's lap at the time. <laughs> we, I played that game with my dad. Um, but, yeah. uh, but there was, I mean, the game, it's hard to communicate really how kind of clearly ahead of its time the game was. Um, oh, yeah. and, and so it's especially remarkable or maybe I, let's see, I can't do the math. Does that make it more or less remarkable that it's held up this long? I mean, um, if you ask me. Uh, you're not. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, it, it, I mean, at one end, it was kind of based on uh, really sound principles of, you know, it's going to be it's going to be puzzles and it's going to be in this drama. I don't I don't know how innovative that was at the time, uh, except you basically couldn't have little cut scenes of drama yet i mean that was just just happening with things mm. like wing commander we didn't know what to call them you know we didn't know what to call a a, a cut scene or a cinematic uh an email went out no it wasn't an email we didn't have email so it was a fax <laughs> <laughs> Your faxes. and, and uh, uh someone was saying i think matt was saying what do we call these little videos that go in between the gameplay and being rampantly self-centered i suggested that we call them a finite amount of theater <laughs> <laughs> but I, I i guess yeah so so i was weirdly involved in in that and wing commander which were two known for two of the first games to use those hmm. um but where it landed graphically also and uh uh you know the the comp compression that Graham came up with that allowed all that amazing video. I mean, Graham, can you tell them about how what, what would happen when you'd show the that that sort of painful episode of showing the game at an early uh, conference? We're starting out strong. Painful it? memories. Let's go with painful memories. Oh, <laughs> it was kind of an interesting. 
you know, we were working on Seventh Guest, and um, at that point, it was there was a lot of blue screen rooms that uh, had um, basic animations in them, and we had the, basically the staircase was done. Uh, some of the of the intro music was done. I think the staircase music was done. The intro music was done, um, and um, it was CES, uh, which was uh, used to be a big conference for games um, in Chicago and in Vegas. Um, and I think this was the Vegas one. Um, and so Rob and I flew out to Vegas um, with, uh, with the CD-ROM drive and um, with the CD. And we were only meant to show the current status of Seventh Guest behind closed doors to Boss and Alpa. Um, and it was meant to be just a, 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 you know, can we please have our money? <laughs> <laughs> because we produced Seventh Guest on a shoestring. Uh, we basically had no money the entire project. I mean, um, it was, we were, we were so poor <laughs> making that whole game. <laughs> um, but um, so basically every month we had a go show bar somewhere we were at and uh, can we have our money? And we get there and we set it all up on a machine that was running, that was previously running, I think, um, Westwood's Dune um, RTS game. And um, then we showed it to Martin and uh, he said, oh, we have to put this on the show floor. And Rob and I are aghast at this. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all demographics. It's got you know, you've got, we, we've got to show this. And so we start to show it, and the booth starts to fill up, and it starts to get crowded, and everyone is looking at some of the guests, and everyone's looking at some of the guests. And um, Roberta Williams um, comes along um, from Sierra, and she's looking at it, she's, and she's like, Do you mind if I bring my team by? <laughs> <laughs> and she brings her team by and she's like, I told you this was fucking possible. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, now we're going to go back and we're going to make this run too. <laughs> oh. But I always remember we were on the plane back to Medford and Rob and I were sitting there on the plane next to each other and we were like, now we've got to finish this game. <laughs> uh, I, I remember reading that story, and it was just it was just so brilliant, uh, especially considering uh, I've, 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 I've talked to Roberta, and I've talked to people who worked with Roberta about how she's an ideas person and not a technology person. <laughs> um, and, uh, and and the things the things you did back then, let's let's just be frank here. You did what was considered impossible at the time. And then you went and did it again in 1995 with the 11th hour, you know, with the 30 frames per uh, second video playing on a 486 kind of thing, which was also considered completely impossible. So is there anything you like set out to do where you uh, every once in a while and you go, I know this is impossible, but I've already done the impossible twice. So why not try again? I think you know, a lot of that comes from just working with people like George and, um, you know, George was the one who came up with using, you know, hey, can we use general MIDI um, mm. as kind of the standard in the game? And I was like, but ad libs the sound format. <laughs> Everybody uses the stuff. Just <laughs> <laughs> like general MIDI is where it's at, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, sure, let's use general MIDI, not knowing that that would, you know, you know what that would generate. I didn't even know a thing about it. Um, so it was. Those kinds of things that you say yes to that meet, that that lead to you know to big changes. Um, and so the music in Seventh Guests comes from you know George saying, "Hey, let's use General MIDI, this new standard uh, that that goes into a Roland MT32 that produces this you know this great rich music um, that's that you know that became the soundtrack. Um, that was really his idea, um, and it's." It's really implementing the ideas of others. That's what it's always. That's what it's always about. I, I love the fact that in the in the manual to the seventh guest, there's a whole like a like a pitch almost for the Roland sound canvas because the soundtrack on the on the second CD is recorded off the sound canvas, and George basically just wrote this thing fucking rules. Everyone <laughs> should get it. And I actually went out as a sixteen year old kid in 1996. And bought a uh, a Roland Sound Canvas daughter board and you know stuck it on top of my Sound Blaster sixteen just so I could go oh oh I see what he meant yeah that's that's pretty yeah, good. I, I think my I think my spin on that was that uh, uh, was thanking Graham and the the team for taking a chance 
on it because yeah. the the real pitch was uh, was not just the tone but the compatibility, but it was compatibility with a bunch of things that didn't exist. It was the only general MIDI. You know, it's like if I had the only telephone. Mm. Yeah, you know, <laughs> uh, it, it, it uh, uh, General MIDI was was at that time just on the sound canvas, and I thought, well, you know, and I, I said it's going to be compatible with future sound cards. Um, but uh, when the sound future sound cards started coming out, uh, they in fact weren't compatible, which led to my starting up uh, with my team. A, a little side project called Fat Labs, where we would certify the future sound cards so that they would work basically with Seventh Guest, <laughs> um, and that led to a lot of political mistakes on my part, which led to a lot of really uh, interesting resolutions, which led to a lot of lifelong friends in that industry. And we ended up throwing a, a conference every year for twenty five years uh, called Project Barbecue, where we'd uh, 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 influence audio hardware and software over the next five years. That was the program. Yeah, I think uh, I've heard of the Fat Labs because, you know, while I didn't play the seventh guest in the early 90s, like I mentioned, your name was everywhere on every other game because as far as I know, you did, went in and recorded and programmed and designed the MIDI timbers that were in use at the time. So, you know, even though a soundtrack and, and and these were all kinds of games, these were like children's edutainment titles. Even though you had completely different composers, you'd usually see a credit for the fat man somewhere, which was always kind of intriguing. I believe you were even credited in, in Windows ninety five if you went in and changed your media device to the to the wave table they had. The, the, those are, those are all the things that that I I. I think we're true, and I've I've told a few times. But when I tell them, I feel like I'm making stuff up about myself. <laughs> we, we uh, you know, I remember it. I, I've you know, that's my amazing. Faulty, I, I don't think I, I, but I remember it. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard that come back from anywhere except inside my head. Uh, no, thank you for that. Seriously? No. The funny the funny thing is, I thought was that in 1994, Access put out Under a Killing Moon. Which mm -hmm. I always thought was like, oh, oh, they're they're trying to one up Trilobite, and they're trying to one up the seventh guest. And in, in Under a Killing Moon, when it starts up, it goes, oh, by the way, the uh, General Media Timbers are courtesy of the Fat Man Sang. I was like, that dude has his hands in everything, doesn't he? <laughs> well, the the way I used to used to tell, I mean, we we did not make money from Fat Labs. It didn't work out that way. And uh, but in the process of uh, you know, but we we did something good and, and it, and it unfolded in a great way in my life. Um, in uh, the process of making the general MIDI sounds for uh, the, the, the general MIDI uh, soundtrack for seventh guest, uh, it could run on general MIDI cards, but it still also had to run on the FM cards mm -hmm. and on an MT32, which was another Roland sort of standard. So, I had to make a set of tones that would work with what I was writing for General MIDI. And as General MIDI caught on, other people needed a set of tones for FM so that they could write for General MIDI. So that, uh, so I made a deal with, with Yamaha and with Microsoft and with John Miles, the Miles sound system, um, that they could all use that. But they had to give me a dollar and they had to give me credit. <laughs> So I got a number of dollars. <laughs> what? The, that these seems are so things we do for a dollar. Uh, you forgot the magic thing, a dollar per unit. <laughs> a, a dollar per, oh, yes, I forgot that. Oh, so yeah. so uh, I guess uh, what I used to say is that I, I used to have have a billion dollar industry by the short hairs. You know, I, I used to ha <laughs> have, them, have them by the, uh, have them in a vulnerable position, but I never actually squeezed um, but uh, I'm very happy with the way that it worked out just for moments like this. Thank you, Fred. Oh, you're it, welcome. It and I think, you know, for my money, what's deeply fascinating about this project coming on late, you know, on two counts coming on late in terms of knowing the game itself and in terms of being a member of, of this band, um, 
is that I, you know, I think the seventh guest and what you guys did is sort of different to other games because I really feel like I'm speaking to two people right now who enabled a lot of the stuff that came after because things were moving really, really fast during the 90s. But stuff like your media timbers and Graham's, um, you know, video compression and, you know, general talents for putting shit together from a bunch of different sources like 3d environments real life actors it really enabled a lot of the stuff that i think we take for granted now but things were moving so fast that it's it, i think it's going to be very very hard for people who weren't there to be able to relate to that yeah that that was kind of my point is that uh seventh guest was so far ahead of things uh technically due to graham and his team um I, I remember there was a review that came out that was critiquing some like subtle aspect of the uh, of the game and and of the the sound, um, and I was just outraged because it's like we it was the first game to have uh, there. I mean, I remember this whole attitude that Graham just showed you of you know sure I guess you can do that. Um, you know, I, I remember asking him if we could, you know, if these CD-ROM things were like CDs and can we put like real music on there too? I mean, we'd already committed to General MIDI. And uh, he said, well, I'm not sure if we can do that, but, you know, sure. Sure, fat man, whatever you say is, is how I tell him. <laughs> and, what I love and, about and, <laughs> and we had to make some calls to find out if it, if it could be done. And, yeah, right. and there was even... Yeah. There's even a fact somewhere where it says where there was something that was like, well, we're going to take out, take that out of the ship. We couldn't get it working in time for the shipping. And I, I threw a little hissy fit, you know, I, 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 I called in my, uh, uh, I, I called in some, some friends. Um, oh gosh, now I'm forgetting names. Yeah. That's what happens. Um, Bill Volk, uh, who had come up with a, a famous early, uh, CD-ROM game, the manhole, um, and had discovered the, uh, the, the Cyan brothers. That's he was always proud of that, that, that he produced that with them. Um, and, uh, but he was sort of an expert on CD-ROMs and I was like, Whoa, call in the big guns. I'm sure you guys had it under control, but, um, but it was that early on. And, and there was that much sort of, I was outraged that, that we had so many new things in that game that anyone could say, well, you need a little bit, you could use dynamic mixing, you know, you could use a little bit better balance, you know? And, and I, I just, it was like, don't you know how far we went in that, in that one? <laughs> and I'm using a lot of we, I'm using a lot of we, but I, I was getting help left and right and support from everybody. You know, I, I kind of feel like I need to go back and say, it wasn't necessarily my idea uh, to innovate by using general MIDI. It was more that if I didn't use general MIDI, I would have to write a lot of different MIDI files and I didn't want to do that work. And I was complaining to my friend, Tom White, who was at Roland. Um, and he said, well, why don't you just write for general MIDI? And what's that? And, you know, he explained it to me. Well, just write for the sound canvas. I'm like, okay. And that, that was, that was the shoulders of the giants that I went and <laughs> stood on <laughs> to go to, to Graham and, and and ask if we could do it that way, and and coming up with the uh, general MIDI tones also, I I uh, had a lot of help from Team Fat, that my uh, uh, my composer friend, Professor K. Weston Phelan, uh, <laughs> helped me come up with those those tones. So we kind of split that down the middle. Um, well, there's but, actually uh, oh sorry, yeah, go ahead. No, no. Well, there's actually an interesting uh, question there because. Uh, as you say, most of the soundtrack in the seventh guest is, is general MIDI, uh, which of course is instrumental. Uh, but uh, the second CD, also it's kind of, kind of an uh, interesting side question is probably why did the seventh guest end up on two CDs when the second mm -hmm. CD just had the just the the attic and nothing else, and then the soundtrack. <laughs> uh, like I went through all of CD one and just went, holy shit, this game is huge, and then it gets to CD two and it's just like the last room done um that's one of the biggest innovations yeah <laughs> it's sheer size yeah it was like okay we're one of the first cd-rom games we are gonna push some boundaries here we're gonna make people invest in two discs um, tell, 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 tell them about the, the, the graham 
yeah. that was the, it was the first big game, right? I mean, what what was it that distinguished that from? You know, you, it's like what was it that distinguished that from encyclopedias on CD-ROM? I mean, that's that's kind of what it comes down to. Is but that, we had to, that, uh, it was it, it used the um, 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 the multimedia CD standard, which was uh, 150 k uh, a second. Um, that, that was a big thing that uh, you know Microsoft insisted on all these computers could suddenly do 150 kilobytes a second um, of sustained reading. Um, and we were on two CDs because we always were measuring about two CDs of full data. And as we slowly came to the end, we realized, hey, we can fit everything on one CD. Um, and um, we called Martin up and said, hey, Martin, we can fit it on one, on one CD and save you a whole bunch of money. He's like, no, 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 Greg. This is, <laughs> <laughs> this is a two CD game. Oh, my God. The marketing on it is huge now. And we were like, oh. You know how hard it is to change a CD. Um, you know, to say please insert CD two in DOS and um, <laughs> and for to, and for MSCDEX, which is the the, mm. the, the, the a little DOS utility, to not blue you know effectively blue screen to make it we could catch fire uh, <laughs> <laughs> because it's it's you know but you know computers back then running it just. You know, just MS DOS did not like you know to have their disc you know to just ejected and you just go in seamlessly continue on in a game. So yeah, we had to make that work. Um, and um, the Red Book Audio a player actually ended up in Quake One as well because um, 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 I was getting to get to know John Carmack a little bit at the time, and um, um, that was uh, we gave him two bit pieces of code from from the game. I think it was target files because every, everything that uh, that we made from from Studio Studio used target files. But the Red Book Audio uh, that plays in Quake One from Nine Inch Nails is the um, it is the Red Book Audio player from Seventh Guest. Oh no way! I did not know that. That's what I'm talking about. You know, because if it wasn't for you guys, then Academy Award winner Trent Reznor would not necessarily get to put his music in Quake. It could have been MIDI music, you know, Atlab music for all we know. That's amazing. There's the I'm thing, sure. right? Because I I remember reading an interview with Trent Reznor uh, where where he was contacted by it and said, "Hey, you want to write the music for Quake?" And he was like, "Yeah, but only if it's not MIDI." Uh, I'm only going to do CD audio. And they were like, okay, we'll get back to you. And it's like two months before shipping, they go, okay, we can do Red Book audio. Let's go. So that was because of they, the game. They would have found a way that they would have called Bill. Yeah. Fantastic. Something in me, you know, I, I was so into me and that I, I, I remember going to a, uh, 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 going to a, a conference and 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 hearing uh hearing them to say that trent reznor was going to do that music and and in my head i was like see i i had a pretty big place in pc game audio and i kind of felt entitled to to get <laughs> that gig uh, and, and, and i mean it, it's, it's a terrible attitude and, and this is what it leads to is like going you know, that should have been me, and 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 I feel like if I ever meet Trent Reznor, instead of admiring him for the great stuff that he did, something in me is just going to blurt out, you know, I should have had I that. Have done you quick. wouldn't have, you wouldn't have been able to do that if it wasn't for me, and you know, I wouldn't even <laughs> reckon the guys that came up with the code. <laughs> I know the best thing is you, you, can, you, can, you can just say, you know what? Yeah, you may have done Quake and you may have sold millions of albums and scored an Oscar winning movie, but I did Zombies Ate My Neighbor. That's and right. you can't take that away from me. That's <laughs> right. Like just yeah, lift right. your finger and go, hey, Trent, who wrote your meaty timbers? <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Uh, so I, okay. I think, so, oh, I'm sorry. No, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, <laughs> I was going to say. I think you, you kind of mentioning that because we we're talking all the PC stuff, but yeah, that was also the fascinating thing for me going back revisiting the games I played when I was younger and seeing, you know, George, the fat man singer popping up in games. I had no idea where even on the, like I played zombies ate my neighbors constantly. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you were involved with like the NES version of maniac mansion, which had some really incredible music, like the, you know, just, just everywhere. But I, I feel, I'm sorry. 
No, oh, and I was just going to say Master of Orion, Wing Commander. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah it's just, just everywhere. But I, I, you know, going back to thinking about any critic at the time having the gall to, to harsh the game for not doing what they wanted perfectly. Like, I feel like I was in the most advantageous place possible. It's like, it's sort of a story of, you know, I'll tell again and again, because I was five years old in 1993. I was the perfect age. We were a Commodore 64 family, you know, had a, had a Nintendo. That was it. And, you know, we played, you know, Maniac Mansion on the Commodore and Zach McCracken. And that was, that was the, the height of technology. And I remember our family going down to Circuit City and then pulling out this Packard Bell Windows 3.1 DOS machine <laughs> and this guy going, check this shit out. And he puts in the disc <laughs> and the game starts. And the music kicks up and we are just blown away. And we walked home with, or not walked home, but we went home with that computer and the seventh guest that day. And it was like <laughs> a whole different world opened up. Mm. And we just never looked back. So it's it's literally, you know, like ingrained in me. I can't imagine, like, I feel so lucky to have been able to grow up as that technology came to exist and then continued to morph from that point. Oh, I agree. It's, it was, it's, it's kind of like, uh, I, I, was, I was the same Commodore 64 NES kid. My dad had a 386 uh, that could barely kick around. And, and then, it, you know, going from that into stuff like the seventh guest was like okay i've been watching silent movies all my life here's a fucking omnimax movie <laughs> like, let's go um yeah i remember the word multimedia that was everything was the multimedia experience yes, that, that was the buzzword years. interactive multimedia just mm. yes yeah, yeah. buzzwords oh, okay, sometimes okay. multi you know sometimes multimedia meant something like the seventh guest and other times multimedia went i don't know clip art in microsoft word or something <laughs> You can put audio in your documents. A kid's yeah, game where you, with a coloring book, you know, yeah. where you click in the space and it fills in the color. Mm. Uh, so uh, the uh, the game, the song, and not the uh, uh, actual game. Um, it's it's uh, it's interesting because, uh, like you said, most of it most of it was instrumental, most of it was MIDI, and then in the in the manual for the seventh guest, uh, there's. A description of why the uh, the song the game came into existence you say it grew lyrics on its own and nobody asked you to record it but no one said you shouldn't record it either so all of a sudden a theme song comes out of seemingly nowhere um did, did you ever like throw that at graham and the team or did you just sort of do it and then <laughs> what yeah, happened there? It, it was a no yeah <laughs> sorry <laughs> The, the, well, it was it was one of those conversations. It's funny we haven't even covered that one yet. Hey, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. When I when I asked if 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 it could do you know real music, he, he said, "Yeah, I could." And he looked into that, and I said, "So, given that, would it be okay if I did like twenty minutes of stuff on my own? You wouldn't have to pay me anything else." But I, I, That's I a had good deal. I had such uh, I had a a good arrangement with them. They were, they were generous in the contract. Um, and I, 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 and looking at just that staircase video that they sent me on a VHS tape. Um, I mean, just from that, it's like, I can't believe I'm part of this. I mean, you, you might've felt like you were in the right place at the right time being five years old and getting to play it. I was, you know, just, just starting a, a career and uh, somehow I had impressed uh, Graham enough that he, he knew me from uh, wing commander. And so he saw me as a, as having an established career. Um, so I was in, I was in the right place, right time. And I just saw that thing, and I was like, "I'm going to give this everything that I that I can." Um, I mean, it, it, so the more I put into it, I, the just kind of the better I felt. So, so I asked, "Can I put in that music?" And he says, "Sure, fat man, whatever you say." <laughs> you know. So, I, and we didn't have. Here's how I remember it, Graham, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. I, I don't remember us having a whole lot of interaction. <laughs> Most of it was just go ahead. Well, there was sort of a sense that we should do something that's sort of Danny Elfman. I remember that conversation at the beginning, um, and I remember saying, "Hey, I love Danny Elfman because Beetle was it? Um, a Beetlejuice was just out or something." Um, and you said the dining room music, 
back and you said, here's your Danny Elfman piece. Now, never ask me to do Danny Elfman again. From now on, you get the Batman. <laughs> I had the arrogant thing going on, baby. And I'm like, oh, okay. But you, but you also said the, um, uh, the theme song as well in that one of the, of the violin. And I was like, oh, yeah. oh, well, that's way the hell better. So I'll just let you be the fat man. <laughs> <laughs> but I do love the Danny Elfman piece. <laughs> And um, <laughs> to comment on on Red Book Audio, I, you know, the only part of the game that plays with Red Book Audio is, is the credits. Um, it, 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 it's because it's the only time where we have you know, CD number two in and we can play Red Book Audio at the same time we're actually playing the game. And I remember the first time the two of those, uh, uh, you know, they actually played together. And we're all watching in the office and it's the old... We just finished the code and we got the CD done. It's about to go to press and it was that was... That was a very tearful moment for absolutely everyone on, on, on the team because it was the music, all the pictures, all of the, the team, everything was just together. And that was, mm. you know, that, 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 that moment there is, was, that's the, the, I think the best memory of the, the overall game production that I've actually got is, is watching those credits roll by for the very first time and everything being just clicking. Oh, that's you know, amazing. Just take a skeleton in your closet place first and then um, um, and then the game. And then it's yeah. uh, um, absolutely, you know, yeah, just oh. yeah, and it's just so much to the, you know, to the end result there. Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, so, uh, well, we haven't even talked about skeletons yet. So, so okay, you got the game, which is the seventh guest theme turned into a yeah. sort of slow tempo psychedelic rock song. Uh, what did skeletons? Skeletons is based on Julia Heine's theme, isn't it? Um, uh, it went the other way around. Oh, um, I, I was in a uh, uh, a little community of goofballs, or based on my my brother's friend circle. Uh, we we had a the coffee club, you know, uh, they'd get, most of them would get together and watch uh, the soap operas and drink coffee. And then they also uh, did, uh, we also did a songwriters club. So when, when we'd have parties, everybody would write a song for the party. But aside from that, we challenged each other to write, to get together every couple of weeks and write a couple of songs. And, uh, and, and one of brother Dave's songs was, was that. Mm. uh with skeletons in my closet so he he brought that there and i just thought well that would be a really good fit for this uh i think he had a different number of uh years of living i think it was like 35 years of living because that seemed very old <laughs> <laughs> well, i'm 35 and it is old so it is old right? oh, yeah oh, your brother got oh. that right it's only going downhill from here well, didn't, didn't the yeah, here take place you. in you're so <laughs> young. <laughs> Didn't the seventh guest take place in 1930? So I guess 38 or 40 uh, years would have been quite old. Well, you're lucky to survive and not die from, I don't know, dysentery and diarrhea and whatever they had taking back then. Dysentery. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you have dysentery. Um, <laughs> well, uh, yeah, shit. Uh, so, well, so, 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 um, so Skeletons was the song, and then you not only put his song in the game and changed the amount of years that Julia Heine has been alive, but also appropriated it as Julia Heine's theme. Yeah. In the yeah. So I worked that backwards. So, so David only just, uh, he just had a demo of, of himself playing it on guitar. So we made a big production of it with all those MIDI horns, um, mm -hmm. playing over the top. And, uh, and that having been done, so I guess that's kind of the opposite path that the the game did now that i think of it so i guess it works both ways uh and and so yeah that that became her little theme motif and, and that was a funny thing the whole idea of motifs because again you know wanting to put as much as i i, I was feeling very earnest about about doing the best i could on this one um and so uh i i was reaching around in my memory for tricks that i picked up getting a music degree uh, and trying to remember what 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 that that was all about, and uh, it seems like these operas hold together by by using themes and key areas. I even went for key areas, 
And I, I wasn't really strict about it, but I, I drew up a little chart that, that each character had, uh, had their own key area, their own instrument, their own style of music and a theme song. Hmm. And, and I let myself be very liberal about how to use one person's key area with another person's theme and use another person's instrument to do this. And, 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 uh, uh, I, I think it, it gives you kind of a nice feeling of, of there being these characters and that they are interacting somehow. It's not real strict, but you kind of, I, I, I have a feeling that in those operas, it's not that strict either. You know, there's no, but one of the, hints uh, of this and that floating around. Now, one of the uh, best examples of that is the scene in, in, you know, in the library where everyone gets together to listen to Edward Noggs being an asshole. And, um, and 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 all of that music is timed to the scene going on. Uh, so, uh, knowing what I know about <laughs> meaty timing and all that stuff, Graham, how hard is it to code up a scene? You got FMV playing, everything streaming off the CD, and you've also got a MIDI soundtrack that needs to behave in the background. How does how do you how do you work that? There's some accidents in in the timing that just work. <laughs> 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 it always, it, for, from my end, it always, that part looked like it was implemented just the way that I'd imagined it, Graham. Uh, that always landed um, for me. So you, you, the accidents, they must have worked. Because yeah, the, we, were, you know, we, we were back and forth with George with, with you know, as he said, VHS tapes. Um, cause at that time it cost a hundred, you know, a hundred dollars to burn a CD and we didn't really have players that could really go out well with players to send them all the time that would work as interactive games. So it was here as a, you know, a demo of the video of the playback often against the blue screen or just, uh, what it's going to look like. Um, and hopefully it will play back at 15 frames a second and not 12 as it has been uh, <laughs> and, um you know you know i do want to go back to george says often that you know that he was arrogant throughout this project but george was never arrogant <laughs> um, he, he is george and i became fast friends on this project and he's the kindest soul i've ever worked with and oh oh yes Absolutely, it was always a joy to work with, and I'd work with them again in a heartbeat on absolutely anything. He is absolutely one of the best people in the world to work. With. Oh, thanks, uh, Graham. What, Jesus? Thanks, Graham. I can do it. <laughs> love. You know, there's people that you do work with who are arrogant, and you're like, oh. You learn to spot them pretty quickly, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, which is not one of them. <laughs> Yeah, well, actually, you you mentioned um, that stuff about uh, the light motifs and and the um, the you know mapping each character to keys. What else? Do, you know, I, I'm very curious about how how many guidelines, if any, that you set for musical directions. It sounded like you know Graham pretty quickly learned to not say do Danny Elfman, so <laughs> it was basically go do your own thing, but. I would say there are, there are many, many things in, you know, both the seventh guest and the 11th hour in those scores that you wouldn't necessarily associate with haunted house type games. You know, I think today you would, you know, ironically be more inclined to hear something like Trent Reznor's Quake, you know, technology permitting, obviously. But here are a lot of bongos and a lot of jazz and freaky and harp sections and a tango, you know, how, you know, I'm very curious as to what your thought process behind that musical direction was. That's, that's a, a good question. And I think that the answer could be helpful in a general way. Cause, uh, uh, because I wasn't, being asked to do anything. I mean, like I said, we, we didn't have that much communication along those lines. He's really, the team set me free. Um, and for a while it was scary. And, and I, you know, I was like, someone needs to call me and tell me this is okay or something like that. But my, my process was I set up that sort of grid, you know, of the characters and things like that and mm -hmm. the styles and the key areas and, and, but then I would get up in the morning and I would find sort of the intersection of the Venn diagram, you know, of 
uh, whatever I thought was good enough music that really made me feel like hearing it and where that would meet the needs of the game. Mm. So generally, you know, I mean, it's, on one hand, I would sometimes picture a scene and then imagine the movie playing in my mind and, 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 you know, I'm picturing it on a big screen and what, what music is playing. But on the other hand, if I'm sitting down to do a gameplay piece, I'm like, what is good music? Uh, uh, you know, well, uh, a love Supreme, the, <laughs> I, th I think it's like a Coltrane jam, you know? Yeah. 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 It's a Coltrane. Yeah. Album. Yeah. So let's start there and do like the Beatles did with American soul music. Let's mm. try to do it and let's get it gloriously wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, as someone in, in um, uh, I think it actually was uh, John Paul who said that uh, most composers would have, you know, looked at the seventh guest and gone, okay, it's a gothic horror story. Let's do some gothic horror music and call it a day. And you decided to throw a tango in there and uh, uh, muted trumpets. And uh, in 11th hour, things went even more off the rails. All of a sudden, you got Hawaiian slide guitar and jazz playing as you're exploring the, the mansion. So it's basically like, um, I, I, Fred's question, I, I think, was more like, what? What? what well, that's it. That's you. <laughs> yeah, but just like, yeah, what, yeah, well, that's where did it. those influences yeah, that's that's why it's a general, that's why it's a good answer because I was following my bliss. Hmm. I was finding the thing in me that was like going, oh, that would be so fun to play with today. Hmm. And I think that that's what you feel. You know, I think that, that when you listen to it, you, you know, that you're feeling where it's successful is that I was rolling around in this luscious uh free uh you know just this pile of musical cookie dough you know and, and and i think that that's why that's why it's successful i i had access to a world class pedal steel player and uh and i thought you know let's just take what's good and make that work mm -hmm. so again the principle of of letting your people you know getting getting people who know what they're doing and and sort of setting them free that was big, and and that that can only happen when that's the corporate culture, and <laughs> and it, it really was with Graham and, and with mm. Rob, uh, and and so uh, uh, I felt like I was free to, uh, you know, when you have an idea that makes you sit up in the middle of the night and go, I could. I could get a pet alligator, you know, <laughs> and take it to school and the other kids would think, I mean, you shouldn't necessarily do that thing, but pay mm. attention to it. You know, when, when I, I sat up and, and uh, I was trying to think of what my next car would be and I, and I just wasn't excited about anything until I thought, wow, I could get a, for the amount of money I was thinking about spending, I could get a used crappy Rolls Royce. You know, and, and I could, I could take my kid when I, when I got a kid, I would be able to take that kid to Cub Scout meetings and to camp outs. Let's just go off trail with that thing. And, and, and it was so exciting and goofy. And it was that, that was what I was doing musically. You, sir, um, are a man after my heart. <laughs> I, guess, I think that that's, that's what we've got going on here. I mean, that's what, one of the reasons I'm so supportive of this. I think that you guys are doing that with this project. I was oh. about to say, I very much think that's the way trolls and, you know, John Paul are running this. You know, it's if you think this idea is good, it probably is. So let's try it. And, you know, there's yeah. no telling if we wind up with something that's not going to work. At least we've tried it. At least we've, you know, seen it not work rather than just determining beforehand. No, we're not going to do that. And I, I only half mean this, but there's something to it there's clearly no good reason why you guys are doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I can think of and, a few. And that marks it as being a different category from the crap that's being shoved down our throats every day by people who have a business plan. So we don't so have I mean, one of those. Yeah. 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 There's the kind of, 
I mean, it's there's something going on. I mean, you guys have it. Well, if all else fails, we could sell the. You know, I mean, I, I surely there's there's some there's some rhyme and reason to it. But 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 really, the the feeling I get is, come on, boys, let's let's see what's out there. Woohoo! It's, probably a bad is, idea. That's, and and, that's and I like it. that. And I think that that was a, I think that that was part of what we what what I was trying to bring to to seventh guest. And I, I felt like. Um, there was a whole lot of cowboyism going on uh, there too, with you know, Robin Graham. You know, maybe we can do this. You know, uh, you, know I you, guess you the, guys were making molds and then breaking them and then making better ones. <laughs> it's um, just absolute. Yeah, the the, the whole uh, let's throw shit at the wall and see what sticks thing is uh, absolutely just. Um, I, I don't know how to describe. <laughs> quite does that resonate with you, Graham? I think the other thing that really, you know, hearing your talk about things that really stuck out in some of the guests was uh, um, something that surprised me and I think influences more than we give credit for was um, was Deborah Rich Mason. Um, and uh, she played um, Martin Burden. Um, and her, you know, we just found her and, you know, her troop of actors uh, and actresses that uh, you know, that played the part was accidentally did the job that they did in two days at a, about a comic book store in, in Medford uh, of being the characters in The Seventh Guest. And we didn't give them direction. We didn't give them, you know, they had the script, sure, but, you know, but when you look at Deborah being Martin Burden, you know, and, and her drool and her, the, the character that she gives it, and the, 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 the long, you know, you know, she dressed those characters. She, you know, she, she gave them lives. She gave them, you know, and that's really brought some of the guests to life. Um, without that, it would just be an empty house full of, you know, just. You know, they don't get nearly the, the credit, huh? Yeah, and so I was. You know, I continue to think back on that of just how lucky we were to to you know, to come across her, and uh, um, just that was just such a big part of filling in the actual, you know, in the actual game. Um, you know, yeah, it's cool to go up the staircase. It's cool to see the, the you know the hand press the you know you know out of the the painting, but the characters are. A, a, a such a big part. As soon as it turns around, the, you're to the door, and you get to see that first scene, and you get to hear the characters. That really kicks it in, and then the music comes up, and you know, boom, you're sold. Yeah, um, yeah. It's it's the whole the whole package there is just the perfect thing, I think. Um, so, so when you started getting music from George to put into the game, uh, speaking both of uh, Seventh Guest and the and Eleventh Hour, uh, were there ever any times when you went? What the fuck is he smoking? Oh, or was it all just shit? I'll take it. This is brilliant. We experimented a little bit on Eleventh Hour as to how the music was going to be. Um, at first, we were going to try and use um, a mod files for a while. Um, oh, that, that was. Uh, oh. um, but we never got a mod player to really work very well. Um, that was. So that was never something that really worked as an option. Um, but no, it was always a collaboration. I don't really remember ever coming across something saying this doesn't really work in a puzzle or something, or this mm. doesn't really work here. I got one. I got one. There, the, I, there was a uh, one tune. Yeah, da, 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 da. Um, yeah, that that slow thing. The doorbell. Uh, the 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 the, uh, the infernal melody. Oh, that one. Oh, oh right. Oh. Yeah. And, and uh, that was that was. Uh, I I remember hearing back from Rob. He said he 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 had a moment where he was playing the game. And he got to a certain point, and then that infernal melody kicked back in. He didn't. He didn't like that one, <laughs> and so he he said that infernal melody. So that's why I named it that. 
<laughs> but and but you- I also that's the only uh, that's the only tune that I, I actually heard back from a a Berkeley professor. Uh, that was the first time I heard what Berkeley was, <laughs> and uh, uh, Berkeley School of Music. And he said he'd been playing that tune for his students. He said I can't I can't put together how how you made a melody and chords like that. He said, you used 11 of the 12 notes available to you and still made it sound like it flowed. And, and uh, I hadn't realized that I'd done that. And, and, and I, I was thinking, gosh, you know, what note did I miss? <laughs> <laughs> and, really, I, and I don't think it has an end. Right, I don't think that it, it actually ends. So, I think it just segues yeah. into the next thing. So yeah. maybe, Those, maybe in your version of it, guys, you can tack on. You can figure out what the one note is that we don't play, and tack that on at the end. And just, Ta-da! Uh, here's, here's the thing about the <laughs> infernal we're, melody. We we're, are yeah. we're we're joking <laughs> internally because the the project file we're using for infernal melody is absolutely cursed. Uh, we, every time cursed. I open it, something breaks. Uh, the first time I exported it, it came out silent. Uh, then the file had to be recovered, um, and and you know, John Paul kept playing, you know, weird notes over it and stuff like it, it is cursed and it takes forever to export and we don't know why. Um, so we are touching it's that. Working, as Graham. As <laughs> yep. It's working, Graham. Yeah. It continues. Um, yep. that was, uh, the, the reason I was fishing for, 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 for that is because my favorite piece in both the games, and I've said this to George uh, sort of embarrassingly, is the music that plays over the train puzzle in the 11th hour. And I, I understand uh, that George was very surprised to hear that tune in the game, seeing as it was a demo that was never meant for, oh, for yeah, publication. That's right. Yes. What happened there? I do remember that. Yeah. Uh, for, uh, on my end, I was working on a theme song, you know, to be like the game for the eleventh hour. And that was a long process. I, I was, uh, my exercise routine was, was, I was riding my bike a lot in those days. And so I would ride my bike up and down the street in Austin and just working out a melody, just working out a melody, working out a melody. Every time I'd exercise, I'd work on that and melody and then lyrics and then, you know, just trying to get something. And so I started when I, I, I couldn't keep all the pieces in my head. So I started putting it down in MIDI and you know why not put a drum beat to it you know and 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 maybe if this goes somewhere i can bend it and shape it and sculpt it into something that could be a backing track and that i could sing over eventually and so at that stage it was like da 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 da, da. sometimes you da 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 sometimes you ain't got far to go tired of living i don't know you know i was just like just just words like that that just just something something waiting for something to catch mm. uh and it just went on for i i think it went on for months until the i should be doing stuff but i'd rather put it off it's like that seemed like a cheap way out but it was fun and i'm not really <laughs> sure why i you know why that was the one but it just was, it was a relief to get out of the other um so, so it had a chorus, uh, three, four, one, two, da, 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 two, three, four. I can't get enough. I try to, da, da, da. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm. It's like I couldn't get any. Like I couldn't get that to do anything, and so lopping that out and putting in, I should be doing stuff, but I'd rather do it and put it off. Uh, that that was good, and and, and uh, it, it was a relief. And also, it had I think that trick from uh, Bowie's. Uh, ashes, ashes to ashes. I was into ashes to ashes. That's where the song "Ashes" uh, is is my mnemonic that 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 song was sort of based on some aspect of that tune. Mm. Um, but uh, when I do, I, I should be doing stuff, but I'd rather put it off until the final hour. Uh, there, that's a phrase of that's a, a three. That's three sections, I think. And then the chords, there are four chords. So that the three section thing keeps going in threes. And the f- it's like it's a three bar or six bar phrase. 
let's figure it out later. <laughs> and then the, the chords are four bars or eight bars. So there's a there's an interference pattern that happens with yeah. those. Oh, trust um, me. I know. I've oh, been working oh, okay. on it lately. Was I right? Is that the song that happens on? Um, yeah, it, it's it's true. It, it, it's it's one of those things where the chorus is is you you ex, you expect four measures, but there's three, and it just sort of jumps at you. Yeah. Uh, and and it, the chorus is still the first, going in groups of four, so mm -hmm. which is good stuff. So but so so how did how did the train puzzle end up uh, in Graham's or Graham's team's hands, and how did it end up in the game? Uh, I remember that George has sent it as a demo by email as a MIDI file, and I was coding the puzzle, and I was out of, of new music to add to puzzles. So I went through my emails from George, and went, oh, I've not used this one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, now I know. And, and when he says emails, he uses the term loosely. We had mixed computers at that time, we, so I don't know how we were, were communicating but I, I think we was, were uh, we were using a BBS. It was BBS, yeah, yeah. And so and, was, and that BBS, by the way, uh, John Miles Miles Sound yeah. System. He was. We were sharing a BBS. Um, he couldn't afford a. He didn't want to pay for a phone line, and I didn't <laughs> want to do the tech of setting up a BBS. So we took his computer and hooked it up at my house on my phone line. And he would come over and work on it, you know, make sure that it was running, and it just ran there. So I had the ability to send files from my from my house, like a like a boss. But it was, it was John <laughs> Miles himself, and, and 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 me just basically roommating, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take my car, but you pay for gas. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. But um, puzzle fit. You know, music. So when I get a call from George, I think. A couple of months later, it took a while for George to notice. Um, he's like, yeah, what the heck? And I'm like, well, I really like it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I can't remember if we, I don't think we argued about it. I think it was. It I don't, was like, I don't think I'd fight you on that one. Uh, you know, looking back on it too, I think I agree with Trolls. I think it's probably my favorite tune from the whole shebang. Oh. Yeah. It, yeah. But it was just one of the ones where it was just an accident that it got into the game. It was just, uh, <laughs> you know. Um, I like that. All right. So, of, um, oh, sorry. A lot of 11 hour coding happened at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I can believe that. Once the, uh, you know, looking at the, the footage of uh, this dude riding a motorcycle and going, that is not going to play on a double speed CD ROM. Yeah. Oh uh, no, uh, but so can I just interject that is incredibly, uh, you know, impressive because my, my, uh, you know, my grip on the history is loose, but I've only recently learned that you basically started work on the 11th hour as you were finishing seventh guest. So what you did in terms of video compression, you did in 1993. And that is insane. I mean, the stuff that goes on in those FMV videos are like, not meant for developers of this earth to be able to compress. Hmm. It was that that was the story I was fishing for was that when he showed the the video at one of those shows that um somebody from one of the magazines, I think, was looked under the table uh, yeah. to to see if if he was playing it back on a on a video cassette or something, they were looking oh, for yeah. the trick, yeah. and 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 it was, you know, it, it was insulting kind of, but then again, it was actually fairly sane, you know. I, I mean, the the things that he was doing were so incredible. Yeah, yeah, that's what and I was getting I also, at. I, I want to uh, share, you know, sort of expose my my attitude to the to the thing because I I, um, I had gone to USC film school for just a minute, you know, just like one semester, and uh, you know, and I felt like I, you know, for me, you know, Citizen Kane, that's a good movie, you mm -hmm. know, Apocalypse Now, that's a good movie, and then I'm watching the, um, you know, I'm watching the the little acting troupe in, in Medford. And, you know, it's good. 
this not Citizen Kane. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm talking like that to, to my wife at the time. And, and, and I said, you know, and uh, it was, uh, that was, the, and, 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 and Graham was, uh, was, I'd talk to him about it and he would say, well, we, I've got this great compression algorithm. And I'm like, these are different, these are different things. Technology is one thing. Artistry is another thing. And this all my internal dialogue, right? And it just <laughs> came out so well. It came out so beautifully in its own way. And then so by the time that, that, that 11th hour was happening, and I had my concerns about that. And then I'd said it to, to Linda, and, 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 and she says, hey, it's Graham. He's got it. It's going to work. Yeah. And that, that was how we rolled, you know. I mean, it, it was, it, it, there was so much incredible stuff going on uh, on, the, on the Medford side mm -hmm. um, that we just, we just abandoned all concern. It, it, you know, like I said, I was being, I had these earnest, these desires to make, you know, this is going to be the best thing. And I and that, that overlaps into other people's space sometimes, you know, mm. you're like, well, are, is everybody, is everybody, has everybody got this? <laughs> and, uh, you know, that, that happens in your head. And then, and, and I think a lot of, a lot of what you do in those cases, I bet that's happening in your band too. I mean, do you ever kind of look around and go, has everybody got this? Is everyone on it today? Uh, yeah, uh, look at those faces. Uh, oh, uh, <laughs> busted. Uh, I think that uh, those, I think, sorry, yeah. go ahead. But sometimes sometimes, it's sometimes just, at the moment, it seems like you don't, right? And then, and then, and then you look back on it, it's like, you know, that was, that was not what I thought it would be, but it's beautiful. Yeah. I, I think <laughs> history has, has definitely shown, like just just hearing the whole creative process behind this instead of you know a rigid micromanagement with a bunch of you know documents of this is how everything is going to lay out like everything from the music to the actors to the actual programming of the game it was everyone just you know letting the artistic urge kind of take over even to the project we're doing right now and uh it, it seems like you know if, if nobody's telling us no then uh something special is going to come out of it and yeah. I've, to I've told Fred no on one or two occasions, but other yeah. than that, yeah. But but for the he most part, life yeah. he doesn't mean on this project. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you did you watch Let it, uh, Did you watch Get Back? You know the Beatles documentary. Yes. Yes, I did at least. And 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 one person said that the takeaway from that is that that maybe great art can and should be goofballed into existence. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a Works complete, you know, it's a lost art, you know, while we're talking about this movies like The Flash and the latest Indiana Jones are tanking at the box office because, you know, and, and you know, that's going to have repercussions in the movie industry because apparently that's, that's how you measure success now in terms of how much money you make. And, you know, th that's completely different. And, you know, talking to you guys, I feel what you did is a lost art. And, you know, Paul McCartney strumming at his bass and suddenly Get Back appears is kind of a lost art too. You know, there's there's so much business in it, like you said, George, and so much industry and, you know, not a whole lot of room for fucking around anymore. And I think that's a real shame. So, but, you know, that's hopefully we can contribute to uh, the uh, state of uh, fucking around with this album. <laughs> It, yes, that's that's the best yes, part of I it. I fully like, support that. Like, um, not that we get to jam, but like, you know, in the previous bands I've been like, we'd be jamming, and you know, you might just look at you go, that's fucking sick, and then you just roll on with that, and then you just got this concophony and noise that um, somehow sounds good at, you know, it's, it's like vomiting into a sausage maker and then getting a sausage at the end. It's just <laughs> fantastic. Like, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe that's the Welsh national dish. Well, if you, if you follow your bliss, you follow your bliss like that. That's that's what you can see the Beatles doing it. Mm. You know, definitely. And yeah. I think uh, the uh, uh, the reason why I'm I'm sort of uh, looking around a bit nervously is because we've actually gone over the hour that I originally promised, and uh, I've been talking a lot. So I was going to uh, ask the individual gentleman here associated with the project. Uh, to you know, have their time to shine and not let the dictator calling the sh <laughs> whatever the hell I'm doing on this project. Uh, yeah, 
uh, get get their like questions at any burning uh g- questions you guys have like jackie what's the one thing you've always wanted to ask graham or george oh god i didn't think about that oh uh, no because i <laughs> <laughs> way to Man, embarrass to be here <laughs> way to embarrass jackie go you <laughs> no i you know i i don't know that there are any any questions i have that i haven't heard you know some kind of sufficient you know at least story related to at this point you know it's this is just again this has just been a lifelong passion of mine so again being able to just be involved and and exalt a piece of art that i love and you know being able to to do that with you know some of the people that helped it happen that's that's all that matters to me (laughs) if i find questions I'll bring them up down the line. Somebody will get them. <laughs> but right now, I'm just, you know, happy to be here. <laughs> uh, Michael, anything? Um, yeah, I'd like to say th- thank you to to the gentleman um, for getting me into a career of IT because the amount of burst cache pipelines, EM386 errors, learning how to program auto execs just to get the game to run <laughs> has led me in, in, an, IT, in an IT business. So, uh, that um oh boy uh, that's uh, yeah I, I i remember getting that game from a friend and i think i spent the whole weekend just programming an auto exec just to get the damn thing to work um yeah and then after that i just waited until i got a full-time job and bought myself a decent computer so <laughs> so uh, yeah thanks for that <laughs> excellent yeah. well uh fred well i feel i've said plenty of thank yous and uh you know, shown my appreciation for what you guys did. Thank you yet again, though. And I suppose in the spirit of the name of the project, um, what are your favorite soup recipes? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, let's hear it. <laughs> wow. Is it tomato soup? Because I hear the Stoff Kitchen really does well with tomatoes. Well, it's obviously chuck soup. Oh, <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> That's, oh, you, yeah, you were I, waiting to tell that joke, weren't you? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, been, I've been waiting for more than an hour looking at the clock. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I have it written they, down they, in the corner here. How does he say it in the thing? It's like, soup's on. Soup's on. That's that's a very good impression. Yeah, did you? you, you uh, I know you guys looked at the the thirteenth doll, the uh, the fan made sequel. Uh, yeah, I looked at a bunch of YouTube videos of it. Soup Skull is actually back, and he is uh, he's in even more jolly spirits than he was last time we saw him. <laughs> <laughs> and he was pretty happy to begin with. <laughs> uh, uh, who was the voice of Soup Head in the eleventh hour? Does anyone know? Well, that's a good question. Because that. Yeah, well, it could be okay. Robert Stein. I wasn't uh-huh. involved. Um, um, a lot of it, a, a lot of the extra video is actually Rob very close to a microphone next to my desk, going <laughs> um, <laughs> because it's he's. Um, and we found ourselves without VO at the end of the game, so we were a bit compressed audio, so it didn't really matter that Rob recorded it on my sound blaster. <laughs> Um, and Rob's got a great voice. Rob has a great voice. Um, so, you know, you, you know, the whole, I remember nothing is, you know, that's Rob. Is, <laughs> yeah, is Rob uh, ego? Really? The, I remember. Um, yeah, nothing. Rob's ego. Yeah, oh, oh all, he is. All the clues, it's all, that's all Rob. He's, he's so, re- he's so relaxed when he's Yeah, speaking. he is an incredible yeah. narrator. Um, and wow. so... We would be like, we need a clue here. So we would work on that and, and we'd wait for a quiet moment in the street of Jacksonville, Oregon, and uh, we'd record it. Um, that's, that's either Rob or, um, or Robert Stein. So hmm. uh, right there, I think, for the soup. Ah, uh, well, he is, he is a lovely, jolly fellow. And we actually asked uh, chat GPT to write out a recipe for Chuck's soup. And we gave him the whole, uh, like uh, we set the scene for it. Chuck has entered the kitchen. <laughs> Julia Heine has an, a hatchet. Staff appears and the soup comes on and says, Chuck him into the soup. Now write out a recipe. And it fucking did it. I, I will be happy to send it to you. If anyone is brave enough to go make that in a kitchen, go ahead. Let me know how it tastes. Uh, throw it my way. I'll give it a go. 
Oh, I, oh we, need, <laughs> we need this. If it, if it turns any other color than red, we've done it wrong. Um, well, I guess for my money personally, uh, uh, cheers. Thanks so much to everyone in the room and even uh, the, the people who couldn't uh, be here. I guess Ooh, John don't is technically... Don't quite so, quite so fast because I, I, I want to make sure that it gets said that everything that I've heard from you guys has been a, a, just a thrill for me. And you've, you've, you've taken, you started out with, with MIDI on a pretty limited synthesizer and you've turned it into something that, that goes to where I, I would have loved it to go. And, and it goes, it goes beyond that in places that I didn't expect, which is that same, you know, we've been talking about sort of that intersection between structure and goofballing. Um, and you guys have, have got that. It's a very good mix of what's expected and what's not expected. Uh, and I've, I've just been just been grinning. And I just hope that people hear it. I really want people to hear yeah, it. Yeah, wait, wait until you hear me on it, then you might change your mind. Oh, so. yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, now you have six I, fingers I, on I one hand. It's going to improve. I, I, I have that faith that, that I that I had in, in Graham. It's just like, well, it's trolls. It'll, it'll, be, it'll be good. It'll be good. Wow. No, it's an absolute honor to, to have someone all these years, you know, 30 years later to sit and say, hey, that game you made 30 years ago, let's, let's you know, that music meant something to us so much that we want to remake it. Uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, I, I'm just speaking, you know, from the point of view of the person who wrote the code, but, you know, it's... it's Incredible, absolutely incredible. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm just speaking for myself now, but it, it is what well, the honor is mine, hopefully others as well. Uh, because you know, again, I was like 13 when the Sounds Guys came out, and it was one of those Jesus Christ, we can do that now kind of moments. Uh, so uh, again, it's like deeply ingrained into my brain. Uh, so the idea of if, I mean, if you told 13 year old me who saw the Sounds Guys for the first time that you know. 30 odd years later, we'd be having this conversation with the, you know, the guys who made the uh, game and uh, we'd be redoing the music and putting it out on a vinyl and all that. I would have just shat my pants and gone into a coma. Um, so I can't believe we get to do this. <laughs> and I keep maybe, saying maybe, that to the band. <laughs> maybe you did shit your pants and you are in a coma and this is all just a coma drink. This is a simulation, isn't it? And then, and then the interview ends, and it just goes to <laughs> TV static. <laughs> the only yeah, yeah. camera still going is Graham's because he programmed it. You're uh, actually in a giant <laughs> smokestack in the middle of London somewhere. It's just, oh, wait, yeah. there you go. There's, there's, there's a reflection of your shirt there, Graham. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh damn, I knew it. Uh, but yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, oh, cheers. Oh, yeah, well. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, why is he showing that? I'm like, this is a little too it. tight, man. <laughs> this is just a little too intricately interwoven. I mean, raise your hand if everything worked out perfectly exactly for you because of the seventh guest. Huh. <laughs> 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 At least your infernal melody saved. Mine didn't. Oh man. <laughs> it's cursed, I tell you. It's it it's fucking yeah. cursed. It's yeah. saved somewhere. <laughs> it's the Medford ghost. Uh, oh, it used to be nine minutes long too, for some reason, and then we cut it down to a more manageable six and a half minutes or something. Uh yeah, it's it's going places. But yeah, I can't uh, wait to hear it. Uh Great. cheers to Graham for uh, I mean I've uh you know, watching the old uh, making of Seventh Cast and Eleventh Hour documentaries, I've always wanted to meet you, so this is a real treat and a real honor for me sir uh, uh george i've said this a million times i can't believe you're letting us do this but uh thank you so much for your generosity and uh hey cheers to all my bandmates for putting up with <laughs> this weird weird idea i had um and actually doing it so fucking cheers everyone <laughs> cheers thank you cheers. thank you thank you all yeah and let the software do the upload once we're off right Yes, please. Yes, <laughs> it just yes. has to go past the soup kitchen and then round back. Uh, there's a little serv uh, staff build a whole little server park down to the coffin area, and it's like just feeling like lonely. Oh, very. <laughs> <laughs> Where did he get yes. those skeletons? No, I'm kidding. I'm going to stop recording now. <laughs> <laughs> okay.